it's how to you, you most effectively use mocks in tests. And I need to click got it. And yep. So hi, I'm Tim van der Lippe. I'm a staff development tooling engineer here at Yen on development and testing tools. Uh, I maintain the Gradle build system and a couple of other testing tools, such as JUnit Mokito. Um, I'm an open source maintainer of Mokito. Uh, so there are two people in the world that maintain Mokito, me and Rafael. Uh, Rafael is the maintainer of ByteBuddy, the bytecode library that Mokito uses. Uh, but I'm the primary maintainer in the sense. So when you create a PR or an issue, I usually am the one to reply. Uh, and previously, I was at Chrome DevTools at Google. Uh, and last year, I moved back to the Netherlands and joined at the end. So I want to explain four topics to you on related to mocking. First, I want to understand the use cases of when mocking is a good thing. I want to explain how Mokito works, so understand the tools. I want to explain when not to mock, when not to use the tool, when I think, OK, there are probably better alternatives, and the impact on software design. So regardless of whatever solution you're going to choose, there will be some impact on your production code. So let's take a look at that. So these are the four topics. Uh, let's dive right in. So mocking use cases. Now, I will have a non-exhaustive list. There are more, but I focused on, the, in my opinion, three main topics of where mocking is useful. And I think the one you are most familiar with is non-deterministic behavior. You want to control for non-deterministic behavior. Things that happen without your control, you don't want your test to break when stuff randomly fails. Now, randomly is not completely true. Uh, it fails for a reason. For example, retrieval from disk, your file system might be broken, or you don't have access to a particular folder. You don't want to your test to fail when that happens. Um, you want to mock for uh, network communication. So when you're on the train and you're developing and you go into a tunnel, you don't want your test to break. Um, this also might mean that you run the test in an environment that doesn't even have access to internet. So these are some things that you want to control for. Uh, maybe database behavior. I put a question mark here. Then we had the presentation before. I think I make the same comment. Maybe you want to mock your database. Maybe not. It depends. Um, as long as there is non-deterministic behavior uh, there, you need to do something about it. Um, and another uh, big one that usually comes up is scheduling. So any multi-threaded stuff where you don't know in which order something runs, you want to control for that and you want to step in. And this is the important part. You need to step in and take control. So previously didn't have control, and you use a mock to take that control upon you. Um, the same time, you also sometimes want to trigger something. You want to trigger some part of failure, and you want to see how your system, how your, your uh, class uh, behaves when that happens. So for example, the surface you're talking to is unavailable. What does your surface do? You want to trigger that case, because usually it's fine. But if you trigger it, you can see, ah, this is what I expected to happen. I might just fail. I might flat out say, my application can't do anything, or I can gracefully fail. But you can trigger this case and see and verify that's the case. Uh, a response timing out. What if you interact with a surface and the surface is just slow? What do you do? Do you have a timeout? Can you handle that case? Do you provide a nice uh, error message, for example? Um, it might also be logic failures. What if the other surface made a mistake? Usually they don't. But what if they do? Can I trigger such a logic failure and see if I can handle it? Can I handle that a particular field is suddenly null? Uh-oh, what do I need to do? So these are the, the cases where it's usually unhappy path. We as engineers usually focus on the happy path. Everything is fine. Everything is good. My test is happy. What if something goes wrong? That's failure handling. And we can use mocks to trigger such failures and see how our system uh, responds to that. And the last one I want to show is integration correctness. Um, what if I want to verify that the other surface was called n times? I want it twice. So we can use a mock to say, OK, verify that I was called twice. And that's an integration that you want to uh, test for. Or the correct order of interactions. What if I want to make sure that, yes, the, sur the surface returned the correct uh, answer, but was it in the correct order? Did it first do x, and then do y, and then do z? Um, so ordering uh, and uh, calling and times is, is part of the defensive coding. Can my code actually handle and making sure that what, maybe whatever order uh, happens, 
that my surface can handle those. So these are three use cases um, that I uh, would like to show. These are, in my opinion, the main ones. Um, there are probably a bit more, but I think most mocking actually should come from these three. And they're probably fewer than you might have expected. And I think that's okay, but we'll get into that. Um, but ultimately, I, I like this quote, if the only tool you have is a hammer, it is tempting to do everything as a nail. And I think this is very important because those use cases, their mocking can shine, but it doesn't mean that for every single use case, mocking is good. It depends, but if you, all you see is you have your mock, you're tempted to use it for every single thing. And this was also in the previous presentation, there's some tension there. So I actually would like to explain to you when and when not it is good to use mocks. Now, before that, I want to show you how does it work with Mokito. Now, I reckon that most of this is not uh, new. Mokito is used heavily by Java developers. So I'm not gonna go into a deep dive. If you want to, we have Javadoc for that. There's a great guide on it, please read it. I'm not gonna go through all of those details. I want to go over the general concept, um, the general life cycle. And so let's say we have a test. We have the article manager. I mean, it's Java, so it has to be a manager. Um, and this manager test, uh, it creates a mock, and then it uses a rule to instantiate it. So the rule is written by Mokito. The mock you annotate, the article database is in your production code. Um, and then in your test, you want to verify some behavior. So you create your, I call subject under test, so your article manager, and you give it that mock, that database. And so you, you give it that mock, and you, you get back your subject on the test, and you start executing something on it. You execute a method. You can do whatever you want, as long as, well, the business requirements say, this is how I expect this uh, class to work. And for example, I can verify that the database was correctly interacted with. So in this case, it persisted the account of Tim working at Yen. And this is the, um, uh, to verify that the, uh, the article manager works, but this is part of a general life cycle where I would identify five steps. You've seen a couple. Um, you saw instantiation of mocks. That's the first one. You create some mocks. The second one is you inject them into the subject on the test. Now, the third one you haven't seen, and we'll get to it in a sec, is setting up stops. Um, it's when you configure the mock to do a particular thing. Then the fourth one is actually interacting with the class on the test. And then the fifth one is optional again, is verifying particular behavior. So I think these are the five general steps that you then use in your test. And these are sort of the, the, the steps that your test goes through. You instantiate mocks, you inject them, you uh, maybe set them some stops, um, you interact with the subject on the test, and then you verify. And if we go back to the, the test I just showed, the first two lines were related to instantiation, um, the second one to actually injecting the mock into the subject on the test. This was number four, and that's number five. So you might ask, where is number three? Well, that's a different test. So in this case, I say, when the database is interacted in this way, I throw an exception. And you might recall from the use cases, this is failure handling. This is when I trigger a failure in my mock and see how the system behaves. And seeing how the system behaves, I mean, I wrote a very simple answer that thrown by. Um, that's not the point. I mean, I even sometimes got comments where it's the same exception, you're literally doing nothing. Yes, that's correct. It's only to show the example. In this case, it's you interact with it and you verify that whatever your system did was correct. And in this case, the verification is I did nothing, which is okay. So these were the five steps, and this is how it maps to particular tests. Again, if you want to sh uh, know more about what Mokito can do and all the features and whatever, please read the Java doc. I cannot explain that in 30 minutes, but these are the general steps. And hopefully when you read your, your test code, you will recognize all of those. Now, this test is where you use Mokito, and Mokito is a hammer. It's great for nails, but not for screws. It's good for mocking, but then not for other things. And so what are these other things? Well, I want to explain when not to mock. So please don't use Mokito for these kind of things. But it's tricky, it's nuanced. I can't say this is when you should, this is when you shouldn't. It depends. So when to not mock, 
please avoid mock complexity. So I see this a lot where I get an issue on the uh, Mokito GitHub tracker and the amount of steps in there is staggering. And then I have a lot of difficulty trying to understand what is happening. Um, I've seen mocks returning mocks. And then, yes, it, it, it can break because Mokito assumes that's not the case. And then somewhere in our bytecode, something goes wrong. And this is super difficult for us. But also, we didn't intend to Mokito to do this. And in fact, I don't think we actually can do anything about it. it literally, with the JVM, it's impossible to do uh, what we want when mocks return mocks. So it might work. It might not. We can't guarantee it. But also because we never intended it to make it work. Um, and I've also seen uh, people implement logic in custom answers. So answers are a concept that Mokito has. You can implement whatever you want uh, and basically take even more control that Mokito allows you. But then you start to implement all kinds of logic. So I've seen list interfaces being mocked and then re-implemented in custom answers. Please do not do that. That's bad. Um, so when you notice these kind of things, please reconsider. Is the mock actually doing what you want? Now, you might ask, OK, but what else? Like, what else can I do? Well, you might actually want to build a fake. I like a fake because it's a real implementation without production constraints. So let's take a database as an example. You can build a database backed by an array list. You will never deploy this to production because it's an array list. It's in memory. It never scales. It's bad. But as long as you have an interface for the database, and a database, when you insert a product and you search for it, this can be implemented using an error list. And that's OK, because you're not targeting a production environment. You're targeting the interface. And you can use this dummy thing that is very fast and will certainly work, because it's not a database, um, will make your test pass. And you can actually verify that that uh, fake database is implementing the interface correctly. And then you can verify that the real database does the same thing. And then if you made that. Uh, made a check, like, yes, my fake behaves just as the real thing, you can use the fake, and that's fast. So now your test would interact with the database, but it's actually your fake one. Um, now, this sounds good, and it is, but it requires a full implementation. You need to implement the full interface. So mocks are cheap. You use mock, you do a thing, and off you go. So it's very cheap to create a mock, or to write a mock, I would say, a new ones here. Um, whereas if you need to implement the whole database interface, you might as well spend two weeks on it. But that might be worth worthwhile if you need to maintain it for a couple of years. It's a trade-off. So the mock is cheap now and might bite you later, whereas the fake will take you a lot of effort but might be better for the long term. It depends. So this is something based on experience that you will need to sort of decide. When do I go for a mock? When do we go for a fake? And the other alternative is use the real thing. Just use the real thing. Um, using the real thing is more closely to what you use in production. Because again, it's a real object. It's the same as the, the previous presentation. Um, and especially because mocking while writing it is fast, isn't necessarily cheap to run. We have to do a lot of work for that mock to do exactly what it's supposed to do. We have to handle the Java 9 module system was an absolute nightmare to, to work with. That was a lot of work for us. Uh, the JDK 17 deprecating internal things, that was a lot of work for us. We have to do a lot of work to make that mock exactly do what it's supposed to do. So while it's cheap to write the mock, it's not cheap to run the mock. And I think this difference is important because then it might actually be more expensive to use the mock to run than the real thing. So this is something, again, you need to decide for yourself. Um, and uh, it might actually be uh, difficult to implement full interfaces. So for the mock, yes, it sounds great to mock the list, but that might actually be very difficult because the list interface is very detailed, has loads of uh, methods. And so especially for those kind of interfaces, mocks aren't really great. But again, think of the use cases. When do mocks shine? And then think about those real implementations and make that decision for yourself. And so I would say, based on experience, choose between nails and screws. You need to get, gather over time your knowledge of when a mock is good 
when a fake is good, when the real thing is good. And then it depends. So I can't say you, in this case, use that, and in that case, use that. It, it really depends on experience. And what I've seen is people sway to one, one side and overuse one thing, then they dislike it, then they go all the way to the other thing and do only that, and then they also dislike it, but really they're somewhere in the middle, and sometimes mocks make sense, and sometimes they don't. It's just based on experience, choose. Um, but regardless of any of that, there will be an impact on your software design. And I think most of you have actually run into this when you wrote some Java, um, that you need to inject your mocks. So static methods, oh, that's like, ooh, static methods. Now I need to mock it. Yes, we have static mock in Mokito. I know. Please only use it when you really need to. Like, yes, we have it as a feature. There are legitimate reasons when static mo method mocking is a good thing. But they're very minor. Like, I, I personally haven't used it. We shipped it because we also saw PowerMock doing crazy things that we never intended it to do. So we ship static mocking as an alternative, which is less bad, but still not great. So watch out for that. Um, instead, you might actually need to change your production code. And now you say, okay, but I want to write a test and now I need to actually change some of my production code. And that's good. I like it. You might actually want to change your code to make it testable and that's good. And when people say, no, no, I, you should never touch your production code if you want to test it, I would like you to challenge that. It's sometimes okay to change that code to actually make it testable and usually that is then combined with improved architectural, all of that jazz. Um, it depends. And essentially, whether you use mocks or the fake or the real thing, you're gonna need to do this anyways. So, well, real implementations really depends. I mean, again, you do you use a dependency injection framework? Do you use Spring to auto wire it? That all might happen. But if you use a fake, you need to inject it as well. So this impact on software design isn't just for mocks. It might be for fakes and reels uh, as well. And the example is, well, you have some production code, you have a method, and you have a dependency, and you call a static method on it. And if you try to mock this, you're in trouble. Again, yes, static mocks work, but please close out for that for now. So you would change your code. So you have a dependency as a field. You take a sip of water, you create a constructor where you take the dependency, you assign it to your field, and then in your method you use the dependency field instead, and you can inject it, whatever framework you want to do. Uh, use a dependency framework, do it manually, doesn't really matter, as long as that mocks, the mock gets in there. If you remember the general life cycle of mocks, the second step, inject your mocks into the subject on the test, that's exactly this. So you need to change your code to allow for that, but you also need to do that for the fake or the real thing, so you might as well, and usually throughout that, uh, you will discover that some particular dependency uh, connections aren't great, uh, especially at the end we found a couple of those, and then it's a bit of a pain, and then you go through it, and then you actually realize, oh, this was, yeah, now it's better, because now we can do X, Y, Z. So this is okay. And I say this because sometimes I hear, yeah, but my manager says, or my tech lead says, don't do this. Please challenge them on that. It's okay to change your code. So the prerequisite for any of this, you have your hammer, you chose between nails or screws. The prerequisite is do not build steel walls. You're gonna have a bad tri time trying to get them in there. So please don't do this. So I explained those four topics that I uh, introduced uh, at the beginning. I explained the, the use cases, again, non-exhaustive list, but these are the most top ones, I, uh, I would say. I explained to you how to use Mokito. Well, I explained to you the general life cycle, whether you use Mokito or not, that's up to you, but I mean, I have a preference. Um, I want you to understand when not to use the tool and what the alternatives are, the fake, the real, um, and ultimately, what you would need to do with your production code to change it, regardless of those, uh, regardless if we use fake, real, or thing, uh, the mock. And so if everything is a hammer, everything will look like a nail to you. Mokito is that hammer. You have to actually choose whether you want a nail or a screw, but in any case, do not build steel walls. Thank you.
how to use most effectively mocks in tests. Yeah, we can take questions, anyone? Okay, just uh, to share, as you say, the using static Mokito is a big pain. I had to once, oh my God. <laughs> yes. But uh, yeah, thank you for your uh, support. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, the, the, we used it because people were using Paramoc for it, and then Paramoc did loads of other stuff, and it created so much trouble for us that we took a look again, and we said, okay, it's worth for us to ship, even though we don't like it, but it's better than the alternative, and that's why we decided to ship, and then put a big exclamation mark, like, please don't use this. Uh, yeah, and then you will see it being used anyways. So, yeah. Thank you. Um what uh, kind of test setup do you have? On which level do you use mocks and stubs and uh, what you described? Um, since Mokito is a library, it doesn't interact with the disk. It doesn't have network communication. We barely use any mocks to mock parts of Mokito. We use a lot of mocks, as in we, we have a tech test package called Mokito Usage. And what we usually do is when somebody creates an issue on GitHub, uh, they have to include a reproduction case, like a snippet of code where it breaks. And what we do is we copy that code. That's what we do. We co literally copy what is in that issue. We copy it into a test, and then we start fixing the bug. And we don't do anything else, because that's what the user ran into. They had that particular issue, and we, we just copy, because that's what the user cares about. And that's what you will see in this Mokito usage package. We see loads of these kind of tests. And you even see annotations like came from this bug or did this particular thing. We do loads of stuff with class loader magic. Um, and so we have loads of tests that do random class loader things then interact with Mokito. But we don't mock parts of Mokito during that. Um, essentially, we instruct Mokito from a library perspective, from a user perspective. And because there's no, like there were none of the use cases, like the non-deterministic behavior, failure handling, and integration. I mean, integration correctness is the one where we actually do have a couple, and and that's it. So we don't try again. Yes. All right. And now I know how to figure out how to make it work. Cool. That, does that answer your question? Yes. So the question is, are there any plans to support native image? And I'm assuming you mean Grau? Yeah, Grau or OpenJDK19. Uh, Open um, I know Rafa is working on Grau uh, as part of a contract for Oracle. I don't know the progress on that because it's all in ByteBuddy. The ByteBuddy is the library that we use to uh, write bytecode. And that's where the, the trouble is, basically. Uh, and Mokito is sort of an interface on top of ByteBuddy. So in that sense, I'm not actually sure. I just bumped the ByteBuddy version uh, that we use. Uh, I know there were some issues. Then there was a sort of hacky snippet to make it work. Uh, this was a couple of months ago. I can ping Rafael and ask like, what the status is. Um, but that's about it. Or I know Oracle has a contract with Rafael to improve the situation there. And that's all I know. Yeah. No questions? I think that's it. Yeah. I guess that's it. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Tim.